Welcome back to the afternoon session. Um, I would like to thank Two Sigma for sponsoring this session. How do we know if data science is for good? I'd like to introduce our speaker, Megan Price. She is the executive director of a nonprofit out in California called the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Along with conducting research and education, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group works to establish a scientifically defensible record of human rights abuses, amongst their many other activities. Um, Megan, I'm thank you for being here. I'm very excited to hear about what you do. Well, thanks so much. Thank you for that warm introduction. And I figure by now everybody kind of knows how this works, but uh, basically all I can see are my slides. So if something goes wrong or if there needs to be a priority interrupt, I need someone to speak up and tell me because I won't be able to see sort of hands waving or, or uh, chat messages. But hopefully uh, we won't need any of that. Uh, and I will spend about the next half an hour or so telling you a little bit about my organization and how how we think about this question for ourselves and then we should we should have plenty of time for some q a at the end because that's really the part that i find most interesting is getting to hear what all of you think is is most most front of mind on these topics and so thank you again for inviting me and and i'm really happy to be a part of this conference i like to start with this xkcd cartoon i suppose it sets a little bit of my baseline skepticism as a person who runs a technical nonprofit in the Silicon Valley area, I feel like I am exposed to this particular mindset quite a lot. And so it's a little bit of a push pull because I do, I, my training is in statistics. I do believe very strongly in doing data science for good. Um, but I think that all of us need to approach those projects with uh, a little bit of, of skepticism around how do we know if not only are we avoiding harm, but are we achieving the most good? And what questions do we need to ask ourselves? And who do we need to be talking to? Who needs to be involved in that project to maximize the good outcomes that might be possible? So just to set a little bit of a tone right up front, and before I get into the specific work that my organization does, I like to talk just a little bit, give a couple of quick examples about what I think of as misadventures in algorithms. And I'm sure all of us who do this work have our own favorite examples. This one may not uh, be as familiar to folks who are in the Texas area, but this happened here in Northern California uh, just earlier this year when Stanford was rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine. And they designed an algorithm to help them theoretically optimize how to distribute that vaccine. And on the one hand, including age as one of the variables in that model made a ton of sense because of course people uh, in, in older age categories are at higher risk of worse outcomes. And so they do need to be prioritized in the vaccine rollout. But the way this particular algorithm was designed was that somehow it didn't adequately balance that age covariate with, and this was specifically, I should say, an algorithm designed um, to allocate vaccine to healthcare workers. And so what it really didn't seem to balance very effectively was the role that those healthcare workers played in their day-to-day -day jobs and their frontline exposure to potentially or, or known COVID positive patients. And the first couple of days, it turned out what happened was who the algorithm was recommending be at the front of the queue was older attendees who might not be seeing that many patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And who was at the back of the queue was younger residents and med students in some cases who were seeing many, many, many COVID positive patients on a daily basis. And so to their credit, they recognized that, that imperfection and they, they rather rapidly made some modifications. But I like this is just a very, uh, near-term tangible example of the ways that some of these good intentions can, can go awry pretty quickly. One of the other examples I like to give of that are these algorithms that folks try to design to predict. This headline says predicting child abuse, but truly what they're trying to predict is families where there is an elevated risk of child abuse. This is a somewhat older example. This is in fact a letter to the editor from the UK where scientists were saying 
maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe don't do this. And in fact, that that uh, opinion held held weight, and and this particular algorithm did not go into use in the UK. But there is a very frequently used algorithm attempting to do this uh, in the county of Allegheny in Pennsylvania, and there's discussion to see if perhaps it will be used throughout the entire state of Pennsylvania. And I like this example in particular because I think it really gets at a challenge in this data science for good area where the motivations, I mean, I think any of us can identify with if there was a way that we could more quickly identify children who were at risk and intervene and, and reduce the risk of harm to those children, of course, any of us would want to do that. The problem is that there are many unintended consequences of this particular approach. And in particular, in, in these cases, what a lot of these algorithms do is they increase surveillance of families and they increase the risk of family separation, which is not a neutral consequence. That is a potentially very negative consequence. And so I think these are exactly the kinds of social interventions that it becomes very challenging to ask ourselves, is this a place where data science can potentially do more good than harm? And this case, I think in particular, is quite interesting. If you Google it, you will find a whole variety of news articles, some of which are, are fawning and are saying it's it's wonderful and it's saving lives, and others of which are saying it's, it's terrible and it is increasing surveillance primarily of of lower socioeconomic families. And, and all of them are, are based on the same data and the same research and the same model. And so there isn't, in this case, I think a clear answer. Um, so that's, that's sort of the challenge that I wanna set up for us for today. And then in this short list of examples, I'll close with one that I think is actually a positive example because I don't wanna be all doom and gloom. And this is an example being used by Crisis Text Line to prioritize their queue of phone calls. And I should, for, for, uh, for transparency, I should say that in fact, this is the way that Pennsylvania algorithm is designed to work as well. It's a way of um, not necessarily prioritizing phone calls, but uh, organizing what an individual should do following a phone call. So it's a different point uh, of intersection into the problem. But in my opinion, this approach with crisis text line for moving around and prioritizing folks who call in to their crisis hotline, I think is a net positive. I think that the outcome of this application of algorithmic uh, analysis is, is better than the status quo. But I think this is, is very much one of those questions where we, we could debate um, if what's happening through the algorithmic filter is that someone who calls in is constantly getting shifted lower and lower in the queue such that they end up not getting the help that they need, perhaps it's worse than the status quo. But to sort of skip to my punchline, in essence, that's the question that our team asks ourselves is, is applying some sort of data science solution to this problem an improvement on other existing non-data science approaches? So that's really going to be the, the framing that I'm going to offer today in the context of a few different projects that my organization does. Uh, and as was mentioned during the introduction, my organization is called the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, or HRDAG, and we are a San Francisco-based nonprofit organization. We are a team of data scientists who partner with human rights advocacy organizations, and together we identify a question of fact or an argument that can be advanced through rigorous data analysis. And I realize that that's a little bit of a vague description, but it's because as those of us who, who practice data analysis know, these approaches have many different applications. And so we're able to work in a variety of different contexts. Over the years, we've been fortunate to partner with a wide variety of organizations, everything from big international organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the United Nations, to small local non-governmental organizations in the various countries where we work. Now, all of our projects really start from this quote from my colleague and co-founder, Dr. Patrick Ball, the human rights stories tell about the worst events that anyone can experience. 
Taking responsibility for human rights information means assuming an obligation to the witness, to the families, and to the victim. We are morally obligated to do the best work that's technically possible so that the victim's story is heard and believed. To do otherwise disrespects the victim's suffering. And that really is the mission statement behind our work. We are a team of data scientists. We do tend to get into the technical weeds pretty quickly, but we always remember that the reason why we're so focused on this bug in our code or the way the data were collected and what's missing from the data is because we have this moral obligation to do the best work that's technically possible. And so that's both the starting point for all of our projects and also my um, heads up to all of you as audience members that the examples I'm going to talk about today are grounded in human rights stories and in particular in human rights violations. And so I am going to talk today about violence that has occurred in a few different contexts and I am going to talk about deaths. There won't be anything graphic, um, but that will be the topic that all of my examples draw on. Now I do plan today to talk primarily at a high level about some of our projects, but we do have a tech corner that you can find on our website where we get into more of those technical weeds and we post snippets of code and we go into a lot more of the details of some of the problems that we're tackling. And so if that's the detail that you're interested in, I really encourage you to start there. And I'm happy to answer some of those more technical questions during Q&A or to follow up offline afterward if folks want to hear more details about some of our coding practices. But for now, I want to give a couple of quick examples of one of the ways that we think about the stakes in our work. Presenting expert witness testimony in court cases is not something that happens very often in our work. But when it does, it presents one of the most tangible and linear connections between the analytical work that we did and the potential income, uh, impact or outcome that could happen from the project. And so this is an example of, again, my colleague, Dr. Patrick Ball, testifying in the court case against General Efrain uh, Rios Montt who was the de facto president of Guatemala in the early 1980s. And he was charged with committing acts of genocide. And what we presented in this court case was this graph, which was a comparison of the relative risk of death for members of the Mayan population as compared to non-Mayan members living in the same geographic regions during the same time period. And what we were able to show was that Mayans were at a five to eight times greater risk of being killed by the Guatemalan army than non-Mayan members of the population. And statistically, that is a pattern that is consistent with targeted violence, with violence that is consistent with acts of genocide. And Rios Montt was found guilty. And when the judges came back with their verdict, they referenced Patrick's work and said that it confirms in numerical form what the victim said. And that's really our, our best possible day. That's always what we're hoping will come out of our work is that it, it confirms and amplifies the individual testimony that victims and their families are reporting. Another example is a project we did in Chad. The first picture on this slide is Reed Brody, who was with Human Rights Watch at the time. And he's standing literally shin deep in documents that were abandoned and left behind by the secret police that ran a secret prison system under president of Chad at the time, Hussein Habre. And these were reports describing the day-to-day -day prisoner count in these prisons. And so it was new individuals who were brought in individuals who were released, which was not something that happened often, and then individuals who died. And that was really the primary point of analysis, was calculating a crude mortality rate in these prisons during the period that Hussein Habre was in charge. And what we were able to show was that the crude mortality rate in these prisons was higher than POW camps during World War II. And so again, Habre in this case was found guilty and the judges specifically said that the findings invalidate the contention of the defense that the detainees were receiving comparable treatment to the usual living conditions of the civilian population. So these are the kinds of outcomes that are possible when data analysis is contributed in a very collaborative partnership uh, project with those advocating for, for better human rights situations. 
So now I want to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail and, and compare and contrast two specific projects that we came that we worked on to to get at this framing that we use internally to ask ourselves, well, how do we know if a data science approach seems like uh, seems seems like a, a net gain in this particular situation? And so the first project I want to talk about is work we've done with partners in Mexico at Data Civica and the Universidad Iberoamericana. And in Mexico, it is not uncommon to discover what are called hidden graves or fosas clandestinas. And essentially what this means is anywhere outside of a formal cemetery where multiple bodies have been dumped. Because of the situation in Mexico, this happens not infrequently. And so our partners came to us and they said, it's very difficult to request investigations to try and find these hidden graves. And so is there a way that we could build a model that would direct some of these investigations that could help us prioritize geographic locations where we should be looking? And so being the team of data scientists that we are, we said, well, let's Let's see if maybe that could be a classification problem. Let's think about all of the municipios or states in Mexico. And we have a list where we know historically these hidden graves have been found in those municipios. And then this was the really hard part working with our partners was identifying municipios where we do not think graves are. And that's hard, right? Because the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence but we relied on our partners' contextual field knowledge to assign a certain list of municipios as not containing graves. And then we had all of this other information just about municipios in general, whether they were urban or rural, how many streets, the general demographics of the population. And it was really just an experiment. Could we design a suitably adequate classification model that could predict from the unlabeled municipios where a hidden grave was likely to be found? And it turned out the answer was yes. This is a list uh, for specifically 2015, the municipios with the highest probability of containing an undiscovered hidden grave. And what was most interesting to us when we presented this to our partners was that they weren't surprised. They said, well, of course, that's where the most violence has been occurring. That's where we would expect these undiscovered hidden graves to be located. But they still, even though the findings weren't particularly new, they still found them to be really useful, specifically because it was so difficult to petition the authorities to conduct investigations to look for these hidden graves. And being armed with a statistical model that was designed by these crazy scientists in California was a really useful tool in their toolkit. And it actually gave them a little bit of distance that they could approach authorities and say, it's not us advocating and saying that you need to look in these geographic regions. It's it's our partners and their scientists and they're nonpartisan and, and, and their, their model says this is where we should be looking. And so for us and our experience was that this particular approach was a net positive, that it was a useful application of data science for good. And I'll just put a pin in that statement for right now and introduce the next project, and then we can compare and contrast them a little bit. So the next project that I want to talk about is work that was done by my colleagues, Christian Lum and William Isaac. And it was specifically criticizing predictive policing approaches. Now, the particular model that they were able to analyze was uh, the one used by PredPol, which all of the predictive policing models are proprietary in one way or another. But PredPol published their work in a peer-reviewed journal and provided enough information that Christiane and William were able to back calculate what their model was. But we think these findings are consistent across a variety of predictive policing approaches. And in particular, what Christian and James compared was drug crimes known to police in Oakland, California. That's the picture on the left. The red shading are drug crimes known to police. And this is based on uh, open Oakland data. And then the picture on the right is self-reported drug use based on a representative public health survey. And so as we can see, 
drug crime that's known to police is a very tiny subset and bears virtually no relationship to self-reported drug use. And this shouldn't be surprising. We know that there are many different reasons why police know about certain kinds of crime in certain kinds of locations. And so what William and Christian were able to show is that if you use the data on the left as the input for one of these predictive algorithms, what happens is it just reinforces that subset of information that the police have access to, and it results in over-policing already over-policed neighborhoods. And in a way, these algorithms are, are suitably named because they're not so much predicting crime as they are predicting police behavior. Uh, but we argue that that still isn't a, a net gain, that that isn't a, a particularly positive application of data science in this case. Now, I do always like to pause at this point and refer to my absolute favorite quote about crime statistics. It is literally from 1897, and it talks about how, because of the partial and selective nature of the police data, comparisons based on them of variations in actual crime over time between places and among components of the population are all held to be grossly invalid. We knew this 150 years ago. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges to our profession right now. And again, I say this as, as a statistician, I, I want to do data analysis. I want to make data-driven decisions, but it is so tempting. It, it feels like in so many circumstances, we have data. We should be able to make a map or a graph and draw some kind of conclusion. But we need to use all of our data science training to be really skeptical about the data generating process. Why do I have this data and not other data? what's missing from what I've been able to observe and record, and how is what's missing going to affect the conclusions that I might draw? Because those are all the challenges and the problems that we run into, because by definition, data science for good is happening in some sort of social space. It's happening using data that's generated by humans. And so we have to ask ourselves these questions. And so, for us, coming back to these two particular projects, what's the difference between graves and policing? Well, in the work in Mexico, a false positive means that we've, we've potentially wasted some resources. We've suggested an investigation where perhaps one wasn't necessary. And a false negative means that we've missed an opportunity. We argue that in this particular case, neither of those outcomes is worse than the status quo. Whereas with so-called predictive policing, a false positive means that a neighborhood can be systematically over-policed. And that really affects the relationship between that neighborhood and the police force. And it can increase the risk of a variety of negative outcomes. And it can also decrease the likelihood that that community is going to seek all kinds of help, not just from police forces, but from other state agencies as well that they may legitimately have needs for. And so in our particular assessment, we argue that in that case, this particular approach is a net negative. So this comes back to that question about why do we have this data and not other data? Because our machine learning models are always going to be a little bit wrong. That's why we're building them. Otherwise, they're not telling us something new. And so we need to think really hard when we apply machine learning models to real world human systems and think about what is going to happen when this model makes a mistake. And that's specifically the rubric that we use on our team to make these assessments about is this data science for good application likely to achieve the most good? We ask ourselves, what's the cost of being wrong? Is it wasting resources or is it affecting a person's life? And who bears that cost? Is it the organization like us that designed the model or is it some other institution that is making some decisions about resource allocation? 
or is it individuals in a community who are having that model imposed on them and who perhaps had no opportunity to interact with or have inputs into that model? So that's the starting point for us in, in evaluating these kinds of applications of data science. Now, with the little bit of time that I have left, I want to shift gears just a little bit and, and make another plea for another way that I think data science can achieve more good. And that's by valuing more of the data cleaning and data processing work that all of us know is how we spend the bulk of our time. And this is a quote from the newsletter that Stephen Rich, a, a researcher for the Washington Post, uh, writes, if you're interested in data science, also if you're interested in woodworking, uh, interestingly, I really recommend that you sign up for his newsletter. It's, it's a really great piece of work. But he, earlier this year, he wrote this really beautiful newsletter about the process of data cleaning and, and generating an analysis ready data set that, that nobody else has. And those of us who do this work know how important that is and how much time is spent getting some data ready for analysis. And I think that that's another way that we can really achieve more with the data science for good movement is by placing a lot more value on Honestly, the pieces of the work that, that we often think of as being sort of boring, helping our partners figure out how do I organize all of these files and, and what are the processing steps that I need to take so that I know what decisions I made and so that I know how I got from the raw data to the potentially much more exciting analysis step. And so I really try and give that that plea to really placing a lot more value in that work. And so I'll close with just one more example from our work that, that really started that way. And this was a collaboration with the ACLU of Massachusetts. And through a Freedom of Information Act request, they gained access to what are called SWAT after action reports. And these are filed by the Boston Police Department every time their SWAT team carries out some sort of action. And when the ACLU approached us, they were at that early stage. They, they had received all of these PDFs as a result of their FOIA request. And they didn't, they had analysis ideas, but they, they didn't really have an analysis in hand. They were at that, what do we do stage? And so through helping them organize and process those files and literally just scrape information out of PDFs, we were able to help them zero in on a very specific analytical question, which was how often are children present when a SWAT team enters a home? And in the kinds of reports that the police department are required to file, they're not required to record this information in any specific place. And so this is a few different examples of where in processing that data, we found this information. And then what we were able to do was design a structured database for ACLU Massachusetts that collated and aggregated all of this information so that then they could present, in essence, what are just summary statistics, just descriptive statistics, but that contained this really key substantive piece of information because the community might not necessarily know that. The community might have a different image of what kinds of households SWAT teams are entering. And so this provides a way for our partners at the ACLU to reflect back to their community. This is the way police are behaving. You as a community get to decide if you think that's okay. Right now, this is all perfectly legal. This, these are forms that the SWAT team filled out after they were fulfilling legal search warrants. But until you're able to extricate this particular piece of information from tens or hundreds of thousands of PDFs, the general public may have no sense that this is happening in their neighborhood. And so that's one of the things that, that we have, one of the conversations that we have been able to be a part of through this work. And, and that for me is really, is really tied to just starting with how do we how do we process and clean data and, and what might we find there? 
So, so that's really the last, um, I guess the last point that I want to make is just to really place more value. Uh, if you are someone who, who wants to volunteer or, or look for opportunities to work in the data science for good space, that what a lot of folks need is, is really data cleaning and data processing. And that's really valuable, important work to do. So I will go ahead and close there because I do want to leave us plenty of time for, for Q&A. But I do want to say thank you again. There are a lot of different ways that you can stay in touch, that you can reach out to me. Uh, we send out a newsletter not too often. Uh, and you can sign up for that and, and get more links to some of these projects and all of those details. So with that, I have hopefully left that slide up long enough for you to dash down some notes. And I will go ahead and stop sharing so that I can see the chat. And hopefully, we can talk about some questions. Um, yeah, no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so one of our questions. Uh, do you have any ideas, pointers, materials on data science education that expands what is offered right now along the directions that you discussed? I love that question. I don't have a lot of specific pointers, but what I will say is I, I came through my statistics program more than a decade ago now. And I, in particular, because of my specific interest, I came through public health school at a time that there were virtually no formal data science programs and there were very few public health schools. But there's been a real explosion of both of those in that in the last decade. And so what I would say is that if this is the kind of data science that you want to do, to look really closely at the specific, not just the curriculum, but the language that gets used by a data science program. The, the two specific examples that I, are, I am aware of is I know the data science program at USF, we work pretty closely with them. They have a data science institute, they have a real focus on ethics and they, they really prioritize that. And they're really creative about the way that they organize their practicum and the way that they get involved in the community. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking with a student in a data science program at NYU who was telling me a similar story that in all of his classes, they really talk a lot about being involved in the community. They bring in a lot of community speakers to talk about what that actually looks like to do that kind of collaborative work. So I would say if you, if you know that this is what you want to do, to look through your options in data science programs and find one that's going to prioritize right from the beginning that kind of interdisciplinary approach. It actually stands out just like when you're giving your talk. This this it'd be really great if this was just a standard part of you know curriculum, of learning data science because it, the the um, sometimes it feels like we we forget the um, impact we can have if we don't think about the whole picture, and. That's not really a question, but I, I very much appreciate, you know, what you, you know, what you showed us. Um, let me see. Okay, so first off, there's a bunch of people saying great talk. Everybody's really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, question from Megan. Apart from the exploratory data analysis part, do you think data science can be useful to predict crime rate? Any anti-criminal activities based on demographic information? Unfortunately, I, I just really don't. Um, and the reason for that is because you have to evaluate any model like that on something. And, and so what we have to evaluate on is existing, in most cases, arrest state. If what we're trying to figure out is, is crime, then we would start with arrests. And we know that all across the United States, arrest data is, is incredibly biased. And, and incomplete, and, and that different kinds of people get arrested for different kinds of activities in different geographic locations. And so I don't think there's a way methodologically to adjust for that. And as we talk about on our team, if what you want to then do is sort of back up and say, okay, well, then what we need is, is like more representative data so that then we can like have a better, a better evaluation mechanism. Once you unpack that, it turns out what you're advocating for is more surveillance, which I also don't feel good about. So, you know, I mean, to a lesser extent, I think, than the the child abuse example that I opened with, I'm I'm sympathetic to this challenge that we all want to live in safer communities and and find better ways to achieve that. 
but I'm just not convinced that there exists a data or an analytical methods approach that actually achieves those goals. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how do you choose uh, or identify projects that you, they can work on? Because I'm sure you have limited time. Yeah, so we are a really small team and we have you know pretty limited bandwidth which we wish we could say yes to every opportunity, but we, we really can't. And so there's, there's two kind of pieces to that. The first one is just the way we, we learn about the possibility of partners and the possibility of projects. And, and that can happen in both directions. We've been doing this work for long enough at this point that I like to joke, but it's really accurate that Patrick Ball has been doing this in particular for almost 30 years. And so, especially in the international space, if somebody's working, um, on a truth commission or with a UN project, eventually someone will say to them, you, you should really call Patrick. And so we have a fair amount of, of cold contacts where folks reach out to us. And then occasionally we'll hear about a particular situation or a particular organization doing work that we're really invested in. And then in those cases, we'll reach out and we'll say, hey, do you, do you have the resources that you need? Is there, any, is there any role that we could play in this work? That happens, I would say, less often because these collaborations rely so deeply on trust. And so the way that works more often now is more just word of mouth. Um, we've been working for several years with an organization called the Invisible Institute in Chicago. And they provide a lot of, of, of links for us to other folks in their, in their community who, who are trying to do data-driven work. So that's sort of how we find out that a project might exist. And then once we have an opportunity, because we are such a small team, we're able to just have a discussion together to decide, do we take on this project? Do we continue this project? And how do we prioritize our project queue? And the way that we do all of that is through a five question rubric. And so none of these questions alone are necessary or sufficient. They're just a way for us to structure our discussion. The first question is, does the truth matter? Uh, which we always want the answer to that question to be yes. Uh, but really what we mean, that's sort of an abbreviation for, is there a question of fact that we can address through better data analysis? Is there a point of leverage that the particular skill we're gonna bring could make a difference? The next question is, do we have a reliable partner? Is there somebody who can help us make sense of the social context? Is there somebody on our team who's gonna own this project? We have projects go on for years and in some cases, decades. And that's not to say that everybody on our team sticks around that long, but we need somebody who's really gonna take ownership and really see something through to the end. And then the last two questions are just, do we have funding? Um, which is nice, but not necessary because we're very fortunate to receive what's called core funding for folks who aren't familiar with kind of the nonprofit model we get grants that support us to take on whatever projects we think are important. And then the other question is, do we get to innovate? Is there something about this project that's going to stretch our existing methods and that's going to present us with some kind of an interesting scientific question? And so in particular with those last two questions, you know, they're sort of bonus. It's always nice. Um, but again, none of those questions are required except maybe the first one. Um, but they, they give us a way to, to talk about and prioritize our, our, our opportunities. It seems like you were having often to have maybe difficult conversations with maybe a police department or child protection services. And do you, are you finding them to be receptive or more receptive than they used to be? I mean, are we, is our data society starting to become contagious? Gosh, I hope so. I like that. I like thinking of it as becoming contagious. You know, I mean, I, it's funny. I was, I was making a little bit of a face cause I don't, I, I don't have a poker face, but but I, I, sh I should rein that back in because actually I do. I, I think in, in little pieces, we have seen a lot of progress. Um, personally, we haven't seen it so much with those sort of um, admit, uh, institutions. We haven't necessarily seen it a lot with police institutions or we definitely have had some awkward conversations with, um, with like Border Patrol and, and ICE. But we have really seen it in our international work with branches of the UN and with truth commissions, where because I think we've been doing that work for so long, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, these are folks who 
really would have just challenged the idea that they needed data scientists at all. And they would have kind of asked like, what, why are you here? What value are you going to add? And now that, you know, Patrick shows up and people say, oh, thank God you're here. Um, and so I think that that is really encouraging. And that really is kind of moving us in the right direction to recognize the value of, of carefully collected and managed and analyzed data. So I guess that gives me hope that we've only been working in the U.S. for about six years. I know other groups have been doing this work in the U.S. for longer, and so maybe they've started to feel some of those shifts. Um, I haven't felt those shifts in the U.S. context yet, but um, I, will, I will remain optimistic that they can be possible. Better is better. <laughs> better is better. <laughs> Um, I, uh, several people are asking, um, do you guys have volunteer work, uh, community, you know, community scientists that can, you know, help with your efforts? Yeah, I love that question. Because we're such a small team, we've had a pretty hard time kind of figuring out the volunteer model, just in a way that's satisfying for the volunteers. So I just want to set sort of expectations. But because we do have all of these US based projects now that are a lot more heavily involved in processing PDFs and, and, and scraping data out of them, I've really been rethinking the way we might be able to incorporate more volunteers into our work. So I would say that uh, the way to, to reach out is either you know, directly to, to me, um, or we have a general email address that's just info at hrdag.org. Um, and if you just send an email that way and say, you know, I, I saw this talk and I'm really interested and, and give us a little info, you know, it could be a resume that you have sitting around or it could be a link to your GitHub repo or, or whatever, just so we sort of know like what skills you bring. Um, and then I can't promise that we have the right fit, but, but it's something that I'm, I'm actively exploring. So I would love to be in touch. Um. Do you run into like because you're talking with so many people? Are you often having to tell them that like you just don't have the data and that you you know it's like we need to start from the beginning and I'll yes. come back in a few years? Yes. So that's those are some of the hardest conversations we have is either the data don't exist. That one's actually a better conversation because then we can sort of give them something constructive to do and we can say, okay, now you have a different problem. Go go do some data collection. Um, but, but it's also not uncommon for us to just have to say, you know, either the science doesn't exist, you know, we can't do the analysis that we want to do with the data that we have, or we can't draw the conclusion that we want to draw. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a partisan way. I mean, very often, like we can't reject the null, you know, so our, our conclusion is sort of, our conclusion is we don't know anything. Um, and and that, that's a thing that happens, especially when your data are messy. And so those are the really hard conversations to have and to unpack. And, and especially when an organization has devoted a lot of resources to collecting and managing data and, and to have to say, you know, well, let's, let's think about other ways that this could be informative and valuable for you because they're not going to be able to answer this specific question that, you know, we all thought we were interested in. Um, to end on a positive note, is there a time recently or in the last few years that you're just like, I really help these people? Like it's, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I hope so. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, yeah. They're like, you know, one of your favorites. Yeah. So my my absolute favorite, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll try and figure out a way to, to tell it very shortly, is the very first project that I came on the team to work on was analyzing data from the National Police Archive in Guatemala. And through that work, we ended up uh, introducing expert witness testimony in a court case in Guatemala where police officers were accused of kidnapping a, a labor leader activist. And this was in the 80s. And, and there, you know, as, as is so often the case in our work there, I'm afraid there isn't a truly happy end. I mean, this, this person has been, has been killed. But when we first got involved in this project, uh, Edgar Fernando Garcia is the name of the individual who who was kidnapped in 1984. And his daughter and his mother were the two people advocating for his case just to find out what happened, just to find the records of, of what had happened to their family member. And we were able to contribute to the court case where not only lower level individual police officers were found guilty, but ultimately the chief of police was found guilty of command responsibility for the action that resulted in, in the kidnapping of Edgar Fernando Garcia. And there's this picture when the verdict was read of his mother and his daughter embracing 
because they finally knew. They knew what had happened and they knew who was responsible. And yeah, that that level of win doesn't happen very often, but I, I keep that picture very close. And and that's a that's a good picture on the hard days. Well, thank you so much. I I, I imagine your 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 organization has helped many, many people, and we're lucky that you're around. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah. Next time in Houston. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we will see you again in about 10 or 15 minutes for our next talk.